This yep. meeting is being recorded. Got it. There you go. Welcome everyone to the Runners Roundtable podcast. Today I am joined by Naomi Morita, and I'm just so excited to talk to you. This whole season is dedicated to female run coaches because I really wanted to highlight what women are doing in this sport and how we're changing the sport. You know, I think men have had the reins for a long time. And I had this realization in a conversation with another coach. I, if you see me looking over here, it's because I'm looking at my bookshelf and the majority of my run coaching books have been written by men. And I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. I think we're seeing a lot more female runners write about running. But when I'm still looking at the books that we consider the classics for run coaching, it's all men. And I think, you know, it is what it is, but I also felt like, okay, but does it have to keep being that way? So I bring all of that up because you have run coaching certifications in so many different arenas, right? Like my run coaching certification is in RRCA. But you've got Lydiard, you've got VDOT, you've got all these, again, those those men that I'm talking yep. about, you've got them. So before we kind of dive into each of those, because I'm so curious, I'm always curious about the ways in which I can grow and how I can learn more. So I'm sure you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a run coach. Let me do all the certifications, right? <laughs> like there's probably like a progression there. So before we get to your actual coaching history, tell us a little bit about yourself and your running story. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's I'm looking forward to a fun conversation because I've listened to a couple of podcasts already and I, it's just so interesting what the different textures of different women coaches are and different styles and different takes. And I think that's what makes running interesting is all the different personalities and different ways of approaching it. And so, so yeah, I started out running. I am actually at my core, I'm just sort of a geeky nerdy person. I'm not a, I'm not a, I wasn't a natural born athlete. I didn't, you know, I didn't come with a lot of physical gifts. Um, And so I was, I'm basically kind of a dorky person. And so I came to running as a way of, but I, um, I learned when I was pretty young, like, as I was hitting puberty that somehow I felt better when I moved. So, you know, it's just, and, and for a long time, I held this sort of idea that, you know, I'm going to school, I'm nurturing my brain, I'm growing my, you know, all the stuff up here and I got to take care of the container too. Cause you know, that's, that's, I got to live with that. And so I, I kind of had this duality of like my mind and my body. And so, you know, I would run to just sort of do the maintenance on the container and all the stuff. And, you know, and I was one of those people that I ran when I first started running, when I was probably about 12 or 13, I went out at night with like sweats and shoes that can only be counted as runners because they had ties on them and not buckles <laughs> or, or anything else. So, you know, we had those shoes and then I had this like weird sh- plaid shirt that I put on over it. I mean, I, I must have, I mean, totally dorky, right? And so, and I ran at night cause I didn't want anybody to see me. And, you know, I ran around the block or whatever. And, but you know, when I got back and the next day I felt better. And so I kept on doing it just because it's like, it made me feel better when I would get my period and get cramps. It would make me feel better to, you know have a little movement in my history. And what I noticed was Sure, you know, when I get crampy, I could feel better when going for a little run. But what I really felt, what really made me feel better is if I was consistent about running and then I would, the, the cramps wouldn't hit me so hard. And so, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, uh, this is just something I have to do, like, you know, to keep, to keep feeling okay. Meanwhile, I'm going to school and investing all this time in my brain and stuff like that. But, you know, so I ran like that until, you know, through college and, uh, you know, through high school and college. And I, I had a brief stint on tra- on in the track team because there was a phase in my life when I was like, oh, um, you know, it turns out that I'm not a great basketball player, but if I try really hard, I can be okay at it. So then I started exploring all these physical activities to try to see if I was like, well, maybe I could be good at this. Maybe I could be good at that. And I went on the track team and I got blown away by these people with like physical gifts who actually are athletic and stuff. And, you know, there I am, dorky me, trying to run. And then, so, of course... I got super demoralized by that because it was like, you know, it, it, it just wasn't, I wasn't matching up to the same level. And so 
I, I quit that after a couple of weeks um, thinking, okay, well, I'm, that's not something that's, that I'm good at. And so I would just, you know, do my running in the dark thing for the rest of the career until, you know, I got out of college, started working. And it was like, when I started traveling, it was the only exercise that I could actually do. Cause you know, you can't play tennis cause you can't, you're traveling. It's five o'clock in the morning. You got a meeting at eight. You gotta, you gotta work, you gotta exercise. So it's like running was the simplest thing. So I, I kind of got into it that way. And I would run, you know, 5Ks and 10Ks and stuff like that in road races. If somebody would say, hey, there's a race, I'd go out and run it. But it wasn't like I was training. I didn't, I didn't do anything structured. So fast forward to, okay, so we started at puberty and then fast forward to menopause. And it's like, okay, I was, you know, sort of not being super rigorous about my running. And so it was like, I was starting to feel kind of pudgy and a little crummy. And I was like, oh, I remember I feel better when I, when I work out. Right. So it's like, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to running. So I visited every running store that had a free, like fun run once a week. <laughs> I'm like, I just start this habit out somehow. So I'm just going to join a bunch of people. And it's like, whichever one hits, that's the one I'm going to go with. It's like, so I, I basically visited each one of them, like in a survey to try to see if there was anyone other than hit goal. One of the stores I really, I met a lot of people that I really liked, so I kept it up. So then I started running like more seriously because these people would like, it was running stores. So people would talk about stuff like training for races. And I was like, oh, light bulb moment, right? It's like, well, I guess I could do that too. Cause these look like normal people. This wasn't back to high school where the <laughs> really athletic people were there. So yeah, so then I started run, uh, running more, more seriously. And that, you know, I was probably in my late forties then. And so, you know, I started, I started running, you know, with the group and I started really enjoying the group dynamics. So ran a couple of races with them and did some speed work with them, which was really, which I really discovered was fun. And then, you know, I, I somehow I got this thing in my head that when I'm like 49 and I'm going to run a half marathon, I always kept myself to the shorter distances. Somehow I got this in my head. I'm going to run a half marathon when I'm 50. You know, these ideas, where do these ideas come from? Who knows? But anyway, so it's like, I'm going to do this. So I went out, this is, this is the way I do things. And I, you know, just like when I was a teenager and I ran out and I tried to run and I was like, okay, I gotta go. I get the idea. You gotta go longer and longer. So I went out and ran six miles and that was okay. And then I ran eight miles and I bombed. And I was like, okay, you know, um, and that was a new feeling for me. I'd never bombed before. And so um, so, you know, walk myself, walk myself back home and like, okay, well, maybe I need some water. I, I could probably, <laughs> maybe water. I need some water. That's great. <laughs> so, so I went to the store, I bought one of those little, you know, running handheld running flasks and, you know, ne then next week I filled it up with water and I took out for, for my eight mile, my, you know, let's try this again with water ran, you know, and, um, got okay through that. You know, the water was definitely helping. And then I got to the nine mile one the next week and I bought again. And it's like, <laughs> so it's like, at that point I was like, oh, okay. So clearly this running thing is, there's more information than I'm not understanding because I can't make myself do this. And it's like, I keep failing and I don't, I, you know, it's like, so what do I do? I joined the uh, training group from the, from the running store that I've been running with. And it's like, okay, maybe if I went with people that actually know what they're doing, I would, I would learn these things. And of course, that's when you learn all the stuff about fueling and running and chafing and real shoes and, you know, all that kind of yep. stuff. So, so yeah, so then, you know, but at that point it's like, now I'm into half marathon. So, um, but I had in my head, this, so this is, everybody's going to laugh when they hear this, but in my head, I was like, okay, it's 13 miles. I know that. And it's like, so I have to run more than 13 miles to be sure that I can actually race 13 miles. It only makes sense to me. It's like, I don't want to show up on the day out of having paid money and like not be able to do it. So I went as, you know, on the coach on this training group was like, you don't have to do that. If you can do 10 miles, you, you know, she said all the things that we all know now, which is like, you, you'll get there. Right. And I was like, nope, nope. I don't buy it. I'm not buying it. It's like, so that's how I am. I'm very much like a, if it makes, it has to make sense to me. And so when she, what she was saying was, didn't really make any sense to me. It's like, how is it possible that you can tell me that if I can only run 10 miles, that I'm okay for 13. I just, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, so yeah, so she's like, so I ran with a training group and they ran their race and my race was a week later. So she's like, you know, you could run this race, you're ready. And I'm like, no, no, I got to run 13 miles to make sure I can run 13 miles. <laughs> 
so I did that, did the half marathon. It was fun. And, you know, I kind of got hooked on the half marathons for a while and did that. And, and, you know, so I was really enjoying that. And that's how I got into coaching was I was having so much fun with the half marathons that this same coach, the one who coached me for my first said, you know, you should be a volunteer coach for this, these other run groups. So we're going to have run groups and you can, you can help other people and stuff like that. And, and I thought, you know, that's, I like that, right? I like sharing. I like the idea of sharing the energy and, you know, there were so many light bulb moments for me that I was like, oh, I'm sure I can help other people because pretty much nobody was as dumb as I was when I started. So I can <laughs> definitely help people with everything that comes up. So, so that's how I, you know, and so they called them coaches. I mean, they weren't certified, nobody was certified or anything, but it was basically like people volunteering to help the run groups and stuff. And so I did that and it was like really, really fun. But one of the things that got like kind of weird for me was like people would ask me questions like um you know and people would say things pretty much like what i said which is like so you're really telling me i can run 12 miles and that's going to be okay for the half and like why and i was like well it's hard because it's like i don't believe i didn't believe that myself so i totally understand that question but it's like i couldn't i didn't have an answer so that's why I, when i started chasing certifications i'm like aha there's such a thing as a coaching certification that's when they're going to tell me all these secrets of running. <laughs> you know, why do you have, why do the long runs always on Saturday or Sunday? What's a tempo run? What, you know, why do you have to stretch? What's, you know, all, I have all these questions. I always have all these questions. Like, why do people say these things? And most of the time, all those books that you have on your bookshelf, they all kind of go, well, like, that's just how it is. Right. These guys have experientially decided that this is what works best for their mostly guys. Right. And so, and it's like, that's not really, again, that's not, that wasn't really a good enough answer for me. So I'm like, no, 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 I gotta, uh, if I go to coaching, if I go to coaching certification, then I'll, they'll learn all these things. And so the reason I have so many certs is because I kept chasing like, why, why, why? And so each one would give me some answers, but none of them ever gave me all the answers. And so at the end of each certification, I'd be like, yeah, I feel smarter. And now I understand things a little more deeply and stuff like that. And, you know, it was helping, but it wasn't, you know, I'm still, I'd still be like, why do they say that? Like, you know, I, I, I have some really dumb questions. Like if you do, like, if you have to run 13 miles for a race, can you train by doing six miles and seven miles? Like why, it, you know, cause that adds up to 13. It's like, you know, why can't you do that? Right. It's like, why does it have to be all at once? Why, you know, it's like, so I have all these weird questions like this and it's like, I feel like, you know, you know, and now that I am a coach, I feel like part of my job is to make sure that you don't have these head scratcher moments. You know, my runners don't have these head scratcher moments. Like, like they can come right. to me and ask me questions and I'd be like, okay, here's, you know, here's generally how it lays out and hopefully I can share some understanding. So, you know, that's really what my, that's sort of my running slash coaching journey is all about. And that's why I have all the certs because I'm, I'm a why person. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Cause I'm, I'm with their, I'm there with you in terms of like the questioning. I always question things and I love that you brought up, <laughs> there were like a few things where I was like, wait a minute, I need to, I need to go back, follow this thread here. <laughs> so first of all, I just want to say like kudos to yourself and to your younger self for making that connection that, oh, I feel better when I move my body, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't anything else. It was literally just, I feel better when I move my body. Oh, the cramps aren't as intense when I move my body or yeah. my body is feeling foreign to me again, because I'm going through menopause. Let me get back into movement because it's something that I like. So I feel like most of us, majority of people, they don't even understand what's happening in their body to tune in enough to make the connection that Oh, movement feels really good. When I right. do it, movement feels really good. So I just want to congratulate you on that because that's something that it takes a while to get. And even then, not everyone gets it. And I'm curious as to how that experience within yourself, how that impacts your coaching, because I feel like runners, and when I, I always say this, people, when I say runners, I'm including myself in this group because I've done a lot of the things that I question. I've done a lot of the things, a lot of the anecdotes that I share, I've done them as well, but you have such a strong basis in running or movement feels good. 
do you have that discussion with your athletes? Because it, like, I guess what I was going to say is that a lot of runners get into running because they want to change their bodies versus figuring right. out a way to feel good in their body. If that makes sense. Like I, yep. I try to tell people that, okay, yeah. A lot of people get into running because they want to lose weight. And once you figure it out and the mechanics and you have your community, the weight will come off, right? but the deeper connection to running that you have, that's what's going to keep you in the sport or the deeper connection to the running, the community, that's what's going to make it easier for you to continue to show up. So do you have that conversation with your athletes at all? I sometimes I do, but a lot of times you're right. It's like a lot of people come to it. Everybody, it seems like everybody comes to it for their own reasons. And, you know, a, you're right. A big proportion of especially women come to running and even men, some men come to running because they're like, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting rounder. I don't want to, I don't like how I feel. And so they're kind of are in touch with like that whole body awareness sensation feeling, but they're not, they're attributing it to like, oh, if I get, if I can fit in my pants, then everything is going to be better. Right. And so, and I think, you know, that's part of it, but it's like, I also feel like whatever gets you started. I mean, for me, it's puberty cramps, right? So it's like, whatever gets you started and then you start like moving and then you kind of, you know, that that's an opportunity for that light bulb to click. And for some people, maybe it never will because they're just not, they're not really in tune with like what's going on. Yeah. But they may find something else. They may find friendship. They may find camaraderie. They may just find a, you know, a space for their brain to relax or whatever. And, and so I feel like, you know, running means different things to different people. And it even means different things to, to the same person at different times. So for me, you know, running is sometimes a stress relief and, you know, I mean, start out as cramps and start, and then it became like just sort of a nice habit. And then it became like stress relief when I was in college and turn into more stress relief when I started working. And, you know, so it's like, it can evolve with your life. And that's one of the things that sort of kept me running was that no matter what my reason was, it somehow always fit, right? It always sort of satisfied something that I needed in my life. And so that's why I keep doing it, right? And I feel like, you know, I try to give people that I work with the space to have their own relationship with running. And I try mm -hmm. to reinforce that re relationship and do what I can to reinforce that relationship. But I don't try to like help them model it after me or anybody else. Cause I feel like, you know, that's, like I said, I start out with as the dorky least athletic, <laughs> athletic person. So like, who am I to be telling you what your relationship to running is? It's not, For you know, sure. it's not my job. So I try to be supportive and empathetic and kind of like nudge people in a certain direction. And, and really you're right the fun is what's going to keep them in it when they, you know, some sort of payback when it's like, okay, this isn't fun in the moment, but like we got done and it's like, wow, I feel really accomplished. I felt kind of flushed and powerful and, you know, like get in touch with that feeling then. Right. So it's like, you know, I, I so I want people to at least, you know, enjoy, have fun with running in whatever way makes it most fulfilling for them, you know, and maybe that's once a week, maybe that's running and training for a marathon, you know, who knows, but it's, it's all, it's all worth it. So. Yeah. And I really appreciate you pointing that out, that running means different things to different people throughout different stages of their life, because it was, I, I'll give myself as an example here, and I'm sure you have a very similar example, right? Where running meant one thing pre-pandemic, <laughs> then right. during the pandemic, running was a lifeline. Like running was that one thing in right. my particular routine that never changed. Like that was just, my kids were home all of a sudden, we're doing school at home, can't go to the store. Like life changed completely. And yet for me, running was that one thing that remained constant. Granted, there were no races. There wasn't like there weren't the run clubs, there weren't those things, right. but it, it still added an element of comfort to my days because I knew that, oh, Monday, I'm going to go run, Tuesday, I'm going to go run, then I'm going to have a rest day. And then, you know, pandemic, I built up our, our, our weights. So I'm like, all right, so I still need to do more. And I feel like it was during the pandemic that I, that I personally took more of an interest in the strength training bit because I'm like, right. well, eventually races hopefully will come back and things like that will come back. And I want to make sure I'm strong enough 
to do that stuff. And then we come out of the pandemic, races start again. And I remember my first race, how nervous I was because I wasn't used to being around that many people anymore. So it was like, oh, this relationship to running is changing. All of a sudden this, this space of being around runners and being in races that I used to love and like really feel energized by it, all of a sudden became a space where I still liked it, but there was an anxiety there that did not exist beforehand. So it's like, even within myself, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it go from, I started running and I just wanted to see what I could do. Then I wanted to pursue very specific time goals. Then I did not want to do that anymore. I wanted to pursue particular feelings. Pandemic comes and running is again, that lifeline of while everything else is chaotic, it's consistent. At least that Mm -hmm. I I can show up for myself on the run. Right. Then we kind of come post pandemic. I don't even know what we're in right now, but this post pandemic life of like, getting reintroduced to the running community as well and trying to figure out, okay, who did I become over those two, three years of real intense pandemic life? And am I still that person? So I just really appreciate that you bring that up because I think it's important for people who listen to this to know that there are going to be changes. And it's okay if those changes happen. It's okay if your relationship to running changes because it is that. It is a relationship. Like, I feel like you don't just start running and you're like, cool, I just ran. No, no, no. Like, I feel like it it actually starts to embed itself in your life. For me, it's a real big part of my identity. And anytime I feel like I'm especially struggling with running, it's because I'm at a juncture where my relationship has to change in order for me to continue with it. So I just really appreciate that you brought that up because I think it's so important for people to know that the runners we were 10 years ago are not the same as the runners we are now. And it's, we're not going to be the same runners 10 years looking forward into the future. That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, I think you can look at it as, um, you know, a partnership in the sense that, you know, I mean, running isn't a person, but it's like, if it was a person, it'd be like a partnership in terms of, you know, I, when I was at the peak of my professional career, I still call myself a runner. I had running clothes. I had a drawer full of running clothes and I probably used them like once a week, once every two weeks. So, you know, my, if, if you, if you kind of looked at my life from the outside, you would say, why are you calling yourself a runner? when you only do it like once every 14 days at at best. And it's like, and, but it's like, no, I have, I have this, you know, I still have the the drawer full of stuff. So I'm still connected to it. Right. It's like, and so, and, and so sometimes, you know, at the ebb, when you're, when you've got other priorities in life, running sort of took a backseat to some of those things, but it's, it's still supportive. Like when I have a particularly angsty day and it's like, I got to get out. It's like, ah, I just had a day or I just commuted, whatever. And it's like, I just need to go move myself a little bit. Cause it's like, that was crazy. And it's there. And when I'm flying here and there, it's like, yeah, okay. Don't have time. All right, fine. Right. So it's like, so, but then now I, I have more time. I can focus on, you know, training and running goals and things like that. And it has a bigger, has a bigger um, spot in my life. It's a higher priority, but I understand for like the people that I coach, it's like they have families, they're raising young kids, they're, you know, they have jobs that they're in full flight with. And it's like, you know, that's a lot to juggle. And so, you know, yeah, you want to accomplish some running goals, but that may not be like the number one priority in your life. I mean, your kids, your, your work, you know, these are other things that happen. And I actually, as a coach, find it far more challenging to find you know find a way to help somebody meet their goals under those circumstances than you know like to me like an elite runner is like well their job is running yeah they have a, a pt and a nutritionist and a, somebody cooks their food and they get to sleep when they want to it's like these are not my runners right it's like i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> absolutely absolutely and i think there's so there's two things there where that i want to really highlight is that We, gosh, what was I going to say? I lost it. I lost, I lost it. I lost what one of them was, but the the other one was, was going to be along those lines of 
of running is something that fits into our lives. It is not our life, right? right. Like none of us, none of us, well, not none of us, but the majority of us do not get paid to do this. The majority of us have to pay out of pocket for the PTs, for the specialty stuff. Like we don't have brand partnerships that are giving us the stuff where we're, we don't have first access to fueling and all that stuff. A lot of us are, are, I call us, I call it the everyday runner. A lot of us are everyday runners that we're just fitting running into it. So I think it's also, that's such a great thing to highlight for people of like, Hey, let's remember that we're fitting it in to what is probably an already busy life. And I remember the second thing I wanted to mention because you you kind of alluded to it and it's this thing that I really try to get people to buy into. And it's the fact that being a runner means you do more than just run. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Because it's like, okay, well, you may physically run every 14 days, but you're probably thinking about running almost every single day, right? Yep. Or you're yep. probably like, like you said it, if you had a stressful day, your go-to thing is going to be like, I need to go outside for a little bit. So it's like, it's something that's still ever present, even though you don't physically do it every single day. So I try to tell people that too, of like, Hey, like when you think about running, what comes up for you? Because if you're just thinking running is just, Oh, I need to go out and physically do it. You're missing a big part of it. Right. How do you get your athletes or any of the athletes that you work with to start to kind of grasp that, right? Like say you have, and the example I always like to give is, is you have an athlete that, um, or this is like, this is always like the, the question that I ask, right? So you have an athlete and it is there, they have kids, they work, all that fun stuff. And then they come to you and they're like, Naomi, in five months time, there is this race and it's the same day. I'm between the marathon and the half marathon. Which one should I do? Right. How would you talk them through that? How would you get them to like figure out which is the best or which is the, the, the most feasible thing given what their lifestyle is like? Yeah. So I kind of start with like what what's pulling people like what's what's really like where's the fire where's the fire inside them and stuff like that and you know what i tell people is nobody's gonna run this with for you nobody can help you you know it's this is something you have to do yourself so um and i have friends who run half marathons and marathons with other friends and you know quite honestly i don't really understand that whole thing because it's like it 26 miles is a long way to go for somebody else and, and so for me, in my head, it's like, it has to be for you. It has to you know, 13 miles, six, 10 K, whatever. It has to all be for you. You have to, you have to want, you have to have your reason and you don't have to have a good reason. You, you just have to have a reason that resonates inside your own head. Of like, yes, this, that sounds like something I really want to do. And, yeah. and so, you know, what I would do in that situation is I would say, which, which of the two, which one pulls you like, which is which is the one that really lights your fire, right? Which is like, tell me which one like really makes you feel like, ah, I want to do that, right? Um, and don't, you know, and a lot of times my, some of the, in this conversation, a lot of people were like, well, you know, I've been running half marathons for a while and my friends all tell me I should, it's time for me to do a marathon. And you know, this like fits in the schedule where I can do a marathon. I'm like, look, you can run half marathons your entire life. Nobody has to run a marathon, right? So don't let anybody tell you, you have to run a marathon, right? And I'm one who delayed for a long time with the whole marathon thing. So it's like, I get it. And it's like, so don't do it because they're telling you to do it. Do it because you want to do it. Do it because you think it's, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tick something in your head that's going to fire you up. If that doesn't do it for you, then do the half, right? If that's what gets you going, do the half. If, if the marathon is like, ooh, I don't know, I think I can, but I, I, I want to try. I want to see what I can do. It's like, now we're talking. That's then the marathon's for you, right? So it's like, I would really help help them by trying to explore what, you know, what really fires them up. And then after that, I would talk about, okay, if you chose a marathon and it's five months, it's like, you know, it's going to be five months of pretty hard work. 
right? So that's where, as a coach, I have to help them be realistic about like, if you wanted to do a marathon, if you want to do this marathon, this is what it's going to take. And so did that fire match what, you know, what I'm explaining to you as a commitment required to do that? And if not, no problem. There's tons of marathons. We can push back. We can, we can find another marathon. You can do the same marathon next year if, you know, if, if there's not enough time in your life. So, you know, I try to like help people like find the best solution for them. And one of the examples of that is when I, when most of the time, when I start working with somebody, I'll ask them about, they'll usually ask me for a plan and I'll say, okay, tell me what else is going on in your life. How many times you like to like run and tell me your travel or like, you know, one of my friends, one of my uh, athletes is an accountant. She's like, I cannot race in April because you know, everything's over. My life does not exist in March and April. So I cannot train. It's yep. unrealistic. And so, you know, all my races have to be in the fall. You know, you're, you're not even going to see for me, see me or hear from me in those, you know, in the early part of the year. I'm like, got it. So, you know, so it, I talk to people about like, what are their life constraints? What do you, what do you got going on? And then I build a plan that actually has those constraints in there. I said, you know, so if you're going to travel this week, we're going to make that a down week for us in the training plan. So we're going to put it in your training plan as part of your life. So I try to weave the training plan around their lives instead of saying, you know, here's the thing that I just ripped out of runner's world that, you, you know, that says you're, it's going to take you 16 weeks to get ready for this race. So, um, and that's part of, I think that helps people understand that, oh, it is part of my life. And I, I, I'm, you know, I try to encourage people to think of it holistically like that because yep. I, you know, like work comes up, stuff comes up and I say, you know, and I always like, and that's part of your plan. It's like, it's in your plan. We had that already, already, you know, notched off. And then, oh yeah, secretly, I also put in a couple of buffer weeks in there so that in case something up, some other things come up, it's like, no problem. You, you know, we got some time. Don't, don't stress about it. So because I work with people that have real lives, it's like, you have to do these things. Cause it's like, I can't be, I can't be the one coming down on them and they're all stressed out. And of course the plan's going to go sideways when everything in their life is going sideways. So, you know, do I need yeah. to be the one adding to that pile of crap by saying, Oh, well, you didn't do your workout. And so, you know, now everything, now I'm not sure you're going to be able to finish the race. It's like, that's, that's not, that's not supportive. So, so yeah. Right. Right. And that's so great because that's something that I, Park on so much in these conversations that your run coach is more than a training plan. Like if you just want a training plan, you can find plenty of them online. Your run coach is a resource for understanding the messiness of life and then creating a plan that helps you run through the messiness of life. When you're giving your your athletes the plan, is it, how do you do it? Do you do it in one week increments, two weeks, a month? Do you give them the entire plan? How does that work? And what is communication like between you and your athlete? So communication is, it depends on the uh, who, who I'm working with, but um, I do, so I generally do the whole plan all at once. And the reason I do that is because I want them to see that, because this is how I would be, I'd be like, I want to see how I'm going to get from point A, which is where I am, to point B, which is where I'm trying to be. And I want to see what Naomi thinks the path is. And then, and then again, back to my dorky self, it's like, it has to make sense. So it's like, yeah. you know, it, the, the whole like, trust me, I'm going to lead you through this, but I'm only going to show you like a week at a time. It, it, that doesn't do it for me, right? Because it's like, I have to understand the whole thing and I have to buy into it. And what I tell people when I show them the whole plan is I'm like, look, you need to, you know, usually I do a first draft and I'm like, take a look. It, I want you to tell me how, how you react. And there's a couple of reactions. I'll give you a couple of examples. So one example is, um, ah, easy peasy, no problem. I could do all that. No big deal. Another option is, holy crap, that's scary, right? I'm not sure I can do any of that, right? So, um, so that's sort of the two extremes. And I said, where I want this plan to sit in for you when it hits you is, ooh, there's some really hard things in there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, but if I did, I would be so badass and so ready for this race. Mm -hmm. I would be like, I, I'm ready to kill it. So that's where you, I said, that's where I want this plan to hit you is like not easy peasy in my sleep, not, oh my God, I just fainted, right? It's got to be somewhere in the middle <laughs> of like a little scary, but not 
overwhelmingly scary, right? And somehow it's like, oh, I think I might be able to do that, right? And so, and you know, so I said, look at it in that context. When you know, we're going to keep tuning it up until we get to that level. And so that's how, that's why I give everybody the full plan is because I want them to see the whole journey. I want them to understand it. I want them to buy into it. I want them to kind of go, yes, that's going to make me badass. That's going to make me ready. I'm buying. I'm I'm buying it. And then what I say is, oh, you can call me, you can text me, you can email me, whatever, as we go through the plan, if stuff changes, your kid gets sick, you have to go on a work trip, you know, you just fall off the plan for because your mother-in-law came into town, whatever, let me know, we'll tweak the plan. And then I'll, I basically move the plan, you know, I move things around based on what's happening in their life. So it's like, I feel like a lot of people think a plan is a fixed thing. It's not, it's, you know, it's just like, it's just like Google Maps. It's like, if there's a giant, if there's a giant accident in front of you, Google says, I'm going to reroute you. And that's what I do, right? It's like, it's like you tell me there's an accident and then I, re, I reroute and, and we still get there, maybe a little later, maybe a little, you know, maybe a little more burning gas, but we'll get there. And so I think that's, that's the difference between a, a coach plan and a, you know, and a, you know, ripped out a runner's world plan. Oh yeah. I, I say the same thing. I say that a plan is a living, breathing thing. Like Mm -hmm. it is, it is something that is a part of that coach athlete relationship. And I appreciate that you share the entire plan with them. And I always like to say, like, I, like, I love when this happens because I'm like, oh, I'm one of those athletes that gets her plan week by week. And for me, it, I'm like, I'm like, I've gotten to the point where I'm okay with it because I have a tendency to overthink things, right? Ah, okay. so, so like, I love that because this kind of goes back, this goes to a question that I always ask in terms of how do you determine whether you and a potential athlete are a good fit for the coaching relationship, right? Because it's kind of like everyone's so different. Some people might see an entire training plan and they might freak out to the point where you can't even reel them back in and say, (laughs) hey, calm down. And that person might be someone who would benefit from seeing it maybe a month out or a week out. And I always like to say that I get my plans or I get my workouts. I I don't want to say plans. I get my workouts every week until my coach gives it to me. But I've been running for so long and I have done so many different training cycles that for me, that's totally okay because I have a pretty good idea for how things are going to build and how things are going to come down. So I bring, I, I always bring myself up in these situations because I'm like, Hey, remember like every athlete is different and every that's athlete's right. context is different for me. I remember when I first started working with my coach, it threw me so off to get the plan or to get, again, it's not the plan because I'm sure my coach, and it's the same thing for me. Like I, I do something very similar where I plan it out the entire thing, not necessarily the workouts themselves, but I look at the mileage. It's, I focus more on the long run when it comes to different races. Cause I like to know like, okay, so how are we going to build that? And then I kind of, I guess I reverse engineer that of like, all right, here are the long runs. And then everything else here this is where we're going to fit in the tempo or the speed or the whatever else or here's that down week and I also love the fact that you mentioned the buffer weeks because I feel like we don't talk about that enough like we talk about you know the typical training cycle of build 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 cut back build 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 cut back right like we think it's going to be a a straight cycle like that when it's like no actually we've got it we've got to have space to negotiate those buffer weeks of, oh, you were sick for an entire week when we were in one of those build weeks. How do we go back? All that stuff comes into play in this, again, living, breathing plan. But when I first started running with my coach, it really, really threw me off because I had up until that point, I had self-trained. I did runner's world. I was Googling, combining the books, bringing things together. So I was used to seeing the entire map of it. But when I started working with the coach, it was so different. And what I was looking for at that moment was something different because I had hit, 
as a runner, my own rock bottom with with it. And it was the 2017, people know this story already. If you've listened to any of these episodes, you've heard me talk about it. 2017 Chicago Marathon where everything went wrong and I felt really broken as a runner after that. And I was like, nope, whatever I did before, I no longer want to do, right? So it's also like kind of meeting the athlete where they are, but I love that you present the plan to them because you get so much valuable information from their reaction. Like it right. really, and that's one of the things I, I try to tell people too, that this, the coach athlete relationship, it's a partnership. Like y'all are working together. So I just love that because you do get more information <laughs> from that when they see that. So if you have an athlete that's like, Naomi, no way, not going to happen. I, I can't picture it. No, 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 no. Uh, you're out of your mind. What do you tell right. them? Like, what does that discussion look like? Because I'm sure you've had athletes that are like, nope, I don't see how this is going to happen. I don't like, <laughs> you believe in me way more than I believe in myself here, right? Right, right. Well, it does happen um, mostly on the workouts. So it's funny because it's like, I think, it's just like you say, well, people can wrap their minds around the long runs pretty easily. Like, oh, I get it. And when I run the half marathon, I'm going to have to advance my running. And so, you know, nobody's going to give me pushback on a seven mile run on the weekend. Right. Cause it's like, of course I have to do that. Right. But it's the weekly, it's in the weeks where it's like, oh, you know, I don't really like doing speed work, Naomi, or, I, or more often what they'll say is, I don't really know how. I, you know, I have, I've tried or I've, you know, somebody tried to coach me to do it that way, but I don't, I feel like I don't really know how either without hurt, uh, you know, and sometimes they say without hurting myself or, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, fear of um, injury in a lot of the people that I coach. Um, and most people come to me with a, with a goal in mind. They're like, Naomi, I have a, I have a half marathon coming up. I have a marathon coming up. I want you to, I want you to coach me. So that's a, another reason why I generally start with the whole plan is because, um, you know, people come to me with the goal, with the stated goal for the new runners. When I have a new runner, um, you know, somebody who's, I did get a couple new runners during the pandemic. And they're like, I just want to make sure I do this right. And I start off. Okay. And for those people, I didn't, I didn't share a whole plan. Cause it's like, we're just going to see how it goes here. So I'm going to give you, you know, maybe three weeks to, you know, to try to build a habit and to get comfortable with it. And for me to see how you take to it right so it's like so I would you know every now you know depending on the depending exactly. on who I'm working with it's like it makes more sense to say you know it's you, you didn't come to me with a goal and you just want to work on some things so I don't I'm not going to give you a giant plan I'm going to help you with the things that you're currently dealing with right now project out a couple of weeks so that you have a chance to overcome those things and then we'll move on from there so it's like and a lot of my athletes that I've worked with through multiple plans we're kind of in that stage now where they're like you know, I, I felt like good on this race, but I feel like I could get stronger in this aspect or that aspect. And so could you help me out? You know, so I'll be like, oh, well, we can work on this for a couple of months. Right. And it's, so it's not really a plan per se. It's more of just like a we're doing this for now kind of thing. So I do have a mix of that. But a lot, you know, I'd, I'd say the vast majority of people that I'm working with come to me and like, I got a half marathon. I got to I, I want to qualify for, for Boston and I want to do it here or whatever. Right. So it's like, so it depends on what makes sense for them, but it's like, I really try to talk yeah. them through the whole process. And I really try to understand, like get myself in their head to like, what is their goal and how, how, what's in their head about it. Right. Cause I know I have some people who are post injury and they're like, I want to run this race. I want to hang with my girlfriends, but I don't want to get hurt. Right. And it's like, I'm coming off an injury just spent three months in PT and it's like, I don't want to be hurt again. Cause it's like, that really sucked. And I'm like, I get it. So they're like, you know, I don't care what time I'm going to run and blah, blah. And so we, you know, we, you, you treat people differently based on where they're going as opposed to the gung ho, like I'm going for the Boston qualifier. Yeah. It's like, get me there. I need to get faster or whatever. Right. So it's like, and you know, again, it's a matter of how their relationship is to running and what, it, what they're, what they're currently doing. So it's my job to fit into that and make something for them that actually fits and helps them with whatever they're, they're struggling with. So, yeah. And my, my focus is really one-on-one. -on -one. I coach, I mean, I did a lot of group training and, um, you know, with the, with the store and stuff like that, but um, I just didn't find it that rewarding because um, when you've got like 12, 30 people running around the track or whatever, and you're like, 
you run by and you're like, hey, pick up your arm or whatever. And it's like, you know, it's like I would go home and I'm like, I don't even know if I helped anybody. Right. It's like I was yelling <laughs> stuff the whole time. But it's like you just like it's kind of a flyby. It and you're, like, you're throwing out information to different people and you're hoping it sticks. But it's like you, you can't because they're such a big group, you can't like spend the time to really focus on one person to make sure that what you said actually hit it. And, and so I found that a little frustrating once I was, you know, I mean, I enjoy the being with people, but it's like the part about not under, not feeling like I was helping them was, is frustrating. So that's why I generally only work one-on-one -on -one with people because it's like, I, you know, my goal is for every one of our sessions together for you to say is successful somehow. Like I learned this, I understand the skill, I felt something, I tuned into something, whatever, right? It's like, it, I have to help you do something new or better in each session. And that's my, that's sort of my goal for myself is every session needs to leave the runner better in some way than, you know, and not just by the, oh yeah, they logged four miles or whatever, right? <laughs> right, right. I just had, so first of all, I had a, a light bulb moment while you were talking because I'm like oh that's why I don't like to see the plan because I don't want to know the speed workouts I don't want to <laughs> think about that like that <laughs> as you were talking I was like I was like oh see I have fun planning speed workouts for other people but when I think about myself having to do that I don't want to know I don't want to know so I love that you, I just thank you because your words I was like, oh, that's why I feel so comfortable not knowing because I don't want to process speed workouts. And right. I've done enough races to know the speed workouts that lie ahead. Right. And I don't want to overthink them or start to doubt myself because that's something that really comes up a lot for me, like this doubt of can I do it when it's like, I've, and when we're talking about the evolution of a runner, right? Like within myself, how I've changed, like it's, it's getting myself from, can I do it to just show up and try, right? Like right. that's been right. a, a transition point for me. And I love what you said about working one-on-one -on -one because I'm very similar in that I need feedback. Like I need to know that the words that I'm saying are landing, like that you're getting them right. And it is sometimes hard when you're working in a bigger group setting. I found that, you know, like if it's like a small group coaching, really small, very intentional, then I still get those same feels, but there is a big difference between, and I hope people who listen to this can also see that for themselves. Like there's a big difference when you work one-on-one -on -one with someone versus when they get a piece of you in the group. Because even right. for the athletes as well, like they're not getting the fullness of who you are. They're just no. getting that little snippet if you happen to catch them at the right time. Right. So thank you for sharing that because I think that's part of it too, where you as a coach have to feel good about what you're doing and you have to know what you need in order to feel good. And right. For you, part of it is, hey, yeah, I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone and I am getting that feedback. I'm showing them a plan. I'm watching their reaction to it. And then we're going to talk about it. And then we're going right. to kind of figure out like, what parts of the plan are you comfortable with? What parts are you not comfortable with? And even beyond that, for you as well, it's like, and for people who are listening, right? It's like you yourself, you make that assessment of, okay, so how much can I actually give to this particular athlete, right? Like you said, you kind of, you have different athletes, different runners who can handle different amounts of information at the time, either based on what's going on in their life or based on what phase of running they're yes. in. And that yes. to me, it's like, again, like you wouldn't get those runners who are just trying to maintain fitness you're not going to get a plan for that. Like that doesn't exist. I, 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 at least I haven't seen it. And I, I've never researched. I've not researched and maybe I should of like, how should I run if I'm just running for fun? Like <laughs> it's, there's nothing because I think part of what you mentioned too is also you have people, and this is a benefit of a run coach is training you in a way that will hopefully help prevent injuries because right. you are training smart and you're training to whatever your capacity is at the moment. Right. And I think, so it, it really is 
runner focused because it's like, you know, there's, when you talk about capacity for runners or what anybody's ready for, when it's very different when you're speaking to one, about one person than when you're speaking about 30 people. So yep. for me, it's like, because you, you always, in the group of 30, you always have to go with the most conservative, don't hurt anybody approach, which means the people that are reaching, you know, trying to find their limit or maybe trying to explore the relationship with running a little bit more. It's like those people don't get what mm -hmm. they need maybe. Right. And so I think, yeah, my, my, I've always felt like, you know, the run coach thing is like, there's a lot of information out there in textbooks and whatnot, and it tells you what to do. But where, where I try to focus with my people, it, you know, my athletes is I'm going to help you figure out how to do it. Yeah. So, you know, remember I started out with the dorky, awkward, not athletic person. So when somebody says don't overstride, it's like, well, what's over striding? How do you know you're doing it? How do you know you're not doing it? You know, it's like, again, all the questions, right? So it was what's like, a stride? You know, it's before we even get into any of that. It's like, what's a stride? Like, right, huh? right. What's a, <laughs> what's a stride? How am I supposed to hold my arms? What am I supposed to do with my head? What am I supposed to do with my knee? You know, and it's like, so they tell you to do, you know, X miles, they tell you to do X pace, but they don't tell you, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's not written down like how to do these things. And it's, I think it's because most of these books are written by people that are athletic and they don't need to be told these things. But yep. for the rest of us who are like maybe not so, you know, athletically gifted, it's like somebody needs to help us. And so what I do is, and the reason I coach one-on-one -on -one is because I help give cues as we run, you know, because I usually run with people and I'm like, try this. Okay. How'd that feel? And then try this. And I'll, I'll throw out all these cues of like, try this, try this, try this. And then they feed me back. Okay, that felt like this, that felt like that. It's like, okay, aha, we're getting closer. Let's, you know, so we fine tune the movement there. And, you know, so I don't tell them what to do. I try to help them discover how they themselves do that, right? Because it's like, unfortunately, we didn't come with an owner's manual with this, all this equipment. And so we're all just fumbling around trying to figure out how to make it happen. And it's like, you know, and I feel like, of course, we get injured, right? It's like people talk about the fantastic injury rate of runners. It's like, well, of course, it's like, if you gave a 16 year old a car and said drive, they'd smash it into the wall in, in a half an hour and who's surprised, right? So it's like, right. it's kind of the same thing with runners is we, we have zero education, we have zero help when it comes to like, not just what, like go run down the you know 100 meters. It's like, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to make myself do that? How does this body do that, right? And yeah. it's like, and it is different for everybody because you know, we all have different physiology and stuff like that. And so for, for me, it's fun because it's like we get to figure out like how we get to wire this thing together. So that you that body, the person I'm working with actually gets to where they need to go. Right. Where they understand stuff. So. So, yeah, it's it's a puzzle every time. But that's that's the fun mm -hmm. part. And I feel like the discovery is in like, OK, fine. Now they know how to do that. And there's a bazillion skills in running like every like every word you see in runner's world. There's like a how that goes behind that, which is like, yep. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because it's like I come back to this. I feel like we hear it a lot in particular with something like cadence, right? So like the number of steps that you take. And that's yep. like one thing that I can take, think of right now where it's like you hear, oh gosh, <laughs> what was it? I think it's like the Daniel's running form. I, I feel like it was maybe that book. You'll have to correct me, right? Where they figured out that like 180 was the ideal cadence number. And that right. everyone should strive for 180. That's what the elites are doing. So everyone should do that. And it was like, for the longest time, that's what everyone, I mean, I feel like even now you still hear that's the gold standard. And it's right. like, but wait a minute, can we kind of pull back a minute and look at the individual athlete? Because maybe that individual athlete has great form, feels great, feels strong, feels all this stuff and their cadence is 170, right? right? Or it's 165. Do we really have to push that person to get to this random idealized number of 180, right? So like, I think that's stuff that that is very much so a benefit of having a coach who can see you in person that who can talk to you about these things or who has the curiosity to learn more about that stuff because that's something... I always find it funny. And I don't know if you've had this experience where like they come to you and they're like, Naomi, I, I was looking at my data and it said my cadence was 165, but online it says 180. How do I do that? 
how do I right. get there? Right? right? Have you had yeah. that experience where it's like they see something online and then they come to you and they're like, please help me do this. Right. I, I get all variations of that. So lately, I mean, I've gotten the barrage because now all the body, you know, all the watches and gadgets have so many metrics. Right. So it's like it, you know, but initially I got the I got the um, my watch told me I'm at 165 and I just read an article that says it's at 180, you know, that, that everybody should be at 180. And so what should I do? Right. And it's like and my philosophy on that is if if you're feeling comfortable and you're you're meeting your goals um, at 165, then peace out, right? It's like we're done. Yep. Um, and but if you're injured or you're subpar, there's something that's not you know that's not meeting up, then we have to look at all the things. And maybe cadence will come up as a thing, but maybe not, right? It's like it depends. And because you know that's the thing. It's like again, these are nobody's nobody's making money running here, so it's like we're not going to fix everything. So, <laughs> so it's like we're, you know, we're going to take one thing that's really important. That's going to be, that we think is the burden, you know, the barrier to you getting where you, where you need to go. And we're going to work on that. And then maybe we're going to work on the next thing. And we're, you know, so it's like, it's like that. So, but you know, yeah, I have, I have a runner that recently came to me and said, my left, right imbalance, you know, I have a left, right uh, rhythm imbalance, you know, how do I fit, you know, should I worry and how do I fix it? Right. And so, yeah, it's like, it's, it's kind of a challenge because it's like, I mean, you learn things with different athletes because it's like, sure. you know, I'm Googling this, like, what, right, imbalance. It's like, what does that mean? It's like, you know, <laughs> how, what, what do the studies say about that and all that kind of stuff so that I can answer her, you know, in a calm and rational way without freaking her out, right? It's like, because I took the Daniels class. Daniel said the reason he, how he came by 180 was he watched a bunch of elite athletes and he noticed that they all sort of focus on 180. But again, guess what? None of my clients are elite athletes. <laughs> so, so, um, and, and like probably 90% of the people that Jan Daniels was watching were probably young men of mm -hmm. which I have zero clients. So for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's probably all those like, you know, high school athletes, collegiate athletes, Olympic probably, athletes. Whatever. Yes. Yeah. So, whatever he had easy access to as a coach himself. Right. And he, and he himself says to his credit, he's like, I notice that they all do this. It doesn't mean that it's the best. It just, it's just a thing I noticed. And to his credit, he doesn't put a lot of stock into it when he, when he talks mm -hmm. about it, but everybody because daniels is such a big name everybody just glommed onto it and says well daniel says 180 and so we're all doing 180 and blah 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 and so um yeah, i actually did a lot of research into that myself because i was super, super interested in that i'm like so why is 180 and then i you know you got to dig around pretty hard to find out that it's like it's it's not a thing it's not a physiological thing it's a it's an observation right it's like he noticed so you know that's that kind of thing is like and I experimented with it myself, like how hard is it to change your cadence? And it's like, it's super hard, right? Oh yeah, this is it. Anything, when it comes to like changing running form, and I feel like that's something that's really important for people to know that it's not from one day to the next. Nope. It's actually like a process to change your running form. Like what you innately do to change it into something that you know, people say is more efficient and there, there are cute running cues to help you be more efficient, but it's so important for people to remember that it's not like you're going to tell them, Hey, tomorrow you're going to do this and they're going to do it. And it's going to be easy. Like it's actually well, going to be hard. And as a matter of fact, this is one of those things where it's like the how actually matters, right? Because it's like, you know, when you tell somebody to, for example, to increase their cadence, they're like, well, when I run, I do this and it comes out, you know, and then afterwards the watch tells me it was 165. It's like, so break it down for me. It's like, how do I get closer to 180 if that's where we're going? Right. And it's like, how do I make all this stuff? Because whatever I would do is different than what I'm, what my body currently knows as running. Right. Yep. So that means I have to retrain all the muscle memory, which is like, this is not up here. It's all down there. So, you know, it's like, and that's the hardest part to retrain is that stuff. And it's like, it has to start with the conscious effort. And then it eventually becomes like a, oh yeah, I know how to do that. And then, you know, after six to eight weeks, it turns into muscle memory, but it takes that long before it turns. And that's how, that's the reason why 
when we're working on something like that, I always go with cues. It's like, okay, if you can, you know, first we start out with, can you feel it? If I can get you to feel it, then we're going to, you're just going to work on that a couple times a week on your own, you know, and practice that until it starts to be like, I can do it on command. I mean, you know, when, I, when right. I think about it, I can do it. I don't do it all the time, but I can, you know, when I think about it, I can do it. Okay. Yep. So now we're going to dedicate a whole run once a week to that. Right. And then, yeah. and then after that, it's like, you know, and then we're going to roll with that for a couple of weeks. And then by then it'll be like six or eight weeks out. And it's like, okay, you're going to find your running form changes. And, and, but that's how we have to do it. It's like, you have to break it down for people because you can't just go, Oh, do 180. Cause you know, that, you I know, love people. that. <laughs> I love that you just broke that down for us because, and again, I try to explain that to people, but the way you put it right now, it's like, Hey, it's a training plan for your training form, right? right. Like it's like, it's like, we're going to start just bringing awareness to it. And like, can you feel it? Can you like, can you actually bring it to mind? Because that's how it is. Most of us, when we go out to run, we're not really thinking about the specifics of our running form. We're just going out to do it. Right. I'm someone who like, when I run, I like to do like body scans and just like, like even just I, my favorite, my favorite little thing to do when I'm running is to like draw my shoulders up and then drop them because then it's like, oh, I didn't realize I thought I wasn't holding tension. But once I did that and my shoulders dropped more, it was like, oh, I was holding that tension. So I love that you break it down of like, okay, let's first work on the feeling, the awareness, the practicing it because that's what you're doing. You're practicing it throughout different runs. And then you build up to like, okay, let's take one run, the entirety of it. And let's do that. So it's just great because it's, again, this reminder that things like changing your running form, they're not immediate, but also the importance of kind of questioning where does that information come from? Why, like, does this actually make sense for you? Or are we basically like sniffing around in an area that doesn't need to be sniffed around, right? Like if you're right. into your point of like, okay, are you meeting your goals? Are you feeling good? Are you feeling strong? Is everything okay? Then um, we're not gonna change anything. We don't have anything right. to do with you. But if something feels off, then that is just one of many things, you know, you're, your watch will give you certain metrics, but let's not forget about how are you sleeping? How are you eating? Right. How is life at home? How is life at work? How right. are the pets? How's your family? Like there's all this other stuff that kind of goes into it. That's not just your watch isn't going to pick up on all of that. I think is, is what I'm trying to say. Exactly. And, and that's actually the, one of the biggest struggles that we have that I have today with people is everybody comes to me and says, you know, all well, my wash told me this or that. And it's like, okay, but, but how does it feel? And, and I mean, I get it. It's like when you start out running uh, as a beginner runner, your heart is exploding out of your chest. You feel like you're, you know, you can't breathe and all this kind of stuff. And to get through that initial phase of cardiovascular, you have to like block all that stuff out because otherwise you're never gonna get through it. Right. So as runners, we start out, you know, if you're successful in getting there, then your first coping mechanism was block, 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 right? Try to hang in there for as long as you can and then, and then you know, and block all those pain and stuff out. And then, but then as you get more advanced, what, we, what I ask people to do is tune in, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite of what had been essentially a survival skill to get through the run before and so that kind of thing is like it takes time to rewire your brain to like associate you know do the association with of your, your mental state and you know where you are and your body and what's it doing it's like you know because it's like ow 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 used to be like never mind just keep going right? exactly it's but true it's get, absolutely true as you get true. stronger it's like no 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 you know, I, I'm particular, I tell my runners, don't run through any pain that changes your stride, because that's something we're going to end up having to undo later. So I, you know, I know you think it's tough. I know you think you have to stay on your plan, whatever, but I, I do not want you running through any kind of pain that changes your stride. And so, but, but people are like, you know, people will do this. And it's, you know, a lot of coaches will say, we just have to get them to stop. It's like, we have to understand that it came from a, it came from a place, a legitimate place. The place it came from was, well, that's how they got to be running in the first place is Absolutely. they got good at blocking stuff out. So we're asking them to do the exact opposite of, of, of that defense mechanism, which needs to be unwired carefully, right? 
So, and yeah, sometimes the first 10 minutes, block, 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 right? That's oh, like, for sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure, people, please, please listen to us here. Sometimes those first 10 minutes, it doesn't matter how rested you are, how great you feel. Those first 10, it's for me, it's always that. It's like, it's yeah. those first 10 minutes. It's definitely that those first 10 minutes or that first mile of like, right. just keep moving forward. Never keep mind. Moving forward Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But after that, you know, it's like, now I want you to tune in and stuff like that. And so that, that transition, that's a mental exercise for runners that, you know, probably nobody's asked them to do that before. And, you know, so that's why a lot, the question I ask the most often during sessions is how did that feel? How yeah. did that feel? How did that feel? How did that feel? And, you know, initially when I first start working with people, they're like, they, they give me one word answers. Fine. Good. Okay. Whatever. I'm like, no, what did that feel like? Right. Did it feel balanced? Did you feel awkward? Did it feel, you know, did it feel right? Did it feel wrong? Did it feel like you're going to hurt something? Tell me how it felt. Right. Give me, give me more texture on that. And, you know, after a while working with me, they get, oh, she wants to know all that stuff, which means yeah. I have to pay Hello. attention to all that stuff. I was going to say, us run <laughs> coaches want to know all that stuff. That stuff yes. is fun for me. I love it. I'm like, yes, give me the details. I want to know right. it all. Right. I want to know it all. How would you describe your coaching style? My coaching style is very much sort of uh, conversational in terms of like, I, I try to get in with people and, you know, we start out with a warm up and usually I talk about like, how's things going? And, you know, I, I usually start out with a very wide open question and I say, how things going? And sometimes people launch right into their running and sometimes people are like, oh, man, I'm having a tough time at work or the kids, who knows, you know, it's like the kids are having a tough time at school and blah, 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 or, you know, or my parents or whatever. Right. So it's like, people tell me whatever's like on the top of their mind and that'll give me insight and they're like, you know, where, where is running in the priority? Right. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, and, or, you know, and a lot of times people come, you know, start, I say, how's things going? They're like, you know, you told me and we worked on this, but then I tried to go out the next day and I couldn't do it. I could do it with you and I can't do it without, you know? So it's like, okay, that's okay. We'll go back. You know, so sometimes they'll jump right in and sometimes it'll be like a long, like, preamble but usually while we're warming up it's like it's a chance 10 minutes or so to chat about like what's going on with them and then and then I'm like okay I have this in mind for your workout today and this is what's on they usually know that if they've been looking at the plan and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't but it's like do, how does that sound to you or you know would you rather work on something else because a lot of times they'll be like I tried you know I did the work workout last week's workout was great but I went running with my friends and I noticed that one of them is doing this or I noticed that I'm doing this and so you know, I'd like to like, what's that all about? Should I, do I need to worry? And it's like, oh, great. Let's work on that then. Right. So it's like, I'm, I, I kind of try to like fit in, fit our time into something that, that is valuable, that gives the most value for where they're currently at. So, you know, and again, I try not to make the plan like, oh yeah, well, it said, I said we were going to have to do this today. So we have to do this today. Right. 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 So, uh, and that's to help them understand that it's like, you can still get there, even if you don't do a letter of every single workout. And it's like, really, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. So it's like, I didn't, tw I said this six weeks ago, it doesn't mean this is the right thing for you right now. So <laughs> yeah, that's like, I, I tell my kids this all the time. I'm like, there's multiple ways to get where you're going. Like there's yes. multiple ways to get where you're going. What would you say if you had to wrap it up into one sentence. What is your coaching philosophy? Uh, my coaching philosophy is to help people with how to do things. So I call myself a skill coach because it's about how about learning skills of running, not just like the brute force of one foot in front of the other. So it really is on the nuance of learning to get better at running, not just like bashing through a bunch of miles. So that's, that's really my philosophy is to help people get better. And sometimes that means faster and sometimes that means longer. And sometimes that just means I don't have to worry about getting hurt. You know, it, it can mean a lot of things, but I try to help people get better. So, yeah. And I love that because it's such an, it's such a inclusive answer, right? It's like better is totally defined by each individual person. For some yes. people better is speed. For some people better is being able to run those eight miles and not bonk, right? Like, that, right? <laughs> right. like everyone's kind of, everyone's kind of different. And I love that. So do you work with people mostly one-on-one -on -one and in person or um, I used, go ahead. 
I used to work with them one-on-one -on -one in person. That was sort of my sweet spot. But then I, I moved from California to Hawaii and I lost a lot of my clients. So I, um, so I actually invented a new method, which is I call the Bluetooth coaching method, which is, you know, we all have phones now. And so you, you, you bring your phone to the track or the hill or the whatever. And, you know, we set up a time and then we agree on it's a hill workout or a track workout or whatever. You pick the place that's close to you. And then, you know, at the point of hour, I call you and, you know, you stick in the earbud and then we do basically the same thing we would have done side by side. But instead, I'm talking to you in your ear. So if I'm, if I'm taking you through a workout, then I basically take you through the entire workout. I also take you through the warm up. I, you know, we chit chat. We talk about everything. It's like and at the same time, I'll be interacting with you. Right. So it's like, how that rep feel? Does it feel like this? Da, 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 you know, and I'll give the same, you know, similar. I try to get the same cues as I would if I was side by side. And I can hear the nice thing is it has a lot of the benefits of being in person because I can hear them breathing. I can hear their footsteps. I can hear, I can, you know, a lot. I don't get to visually see them, but you, if you're running right next to somebody, you don't get a huge, a great visual. Right. Anyway. You don't, yeah. I, you're, you're not even looking at them, but you are right. picking up so on their breathing. Every now and then I'll run like 360 around somebody if I'm in, if I'm with them, but it's like most of the time you're just listening and you're kind of hearing how they're moving and stuff like that. And so that I can get on the, bluetooth so it's like so we do the bluetooth coaching thing for a lot of people um you know uh, i love people. that yeah I've which is that before that is yeah so great. as so far great. as i know nobody else does this and so no. it's like i get the big head scratcher from everybody like what you do in person uh, you do real time one-on-one -on -one virtual coaching what yeah so it's like it's hard was, to I, i've never heard of it and i think it's so great because it is still like Talk about you figuring out still how to do it in the way that makes the most sense for you, even when conditions have changed, which I think yeah. is so fascinating <laughs> and so wonderful. Um, so I love that. I really, really do love that. You're the first coach that I've ever heard to do that. Like I've heard of, you know, podcasts, right? Like podcasts or whatever that will have the workouts and will walk you through it. But it's talk about getting so much out of you as well right. as the runner to be like, coach, I don't know if I can do this or I don't know whatever. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about that. Let's figure it right. out. Let's, let's work let's on it. it. Can maybe yeah. you do it, but maybe go 10 seconds slower. Like let's, let's see, can we mess around with the pace? I love that so much. So, so much. Um, the final question that I have for you, and it's the question I ask at the end of all of these episodes, please know there is no right or wrong answer to this question. The question is, how can we make running more accessible and inclusive? Yep, that's a good question. And I, I thought a lot about that because I think it's a great question. It's a, it's a good thing for us as coaches to always be asking that question. Um, I think... You know, I like to think running is pretty inclusive already because, you know, um, different people come in different shapes and sizes. And as a matter of fact, I learned that, you know, even dorky people can be successful and, you know, don't be, you know, I tell people it's like stand at the mile 25 of a marathon and watch who comes through and when and note when they come through. And it's like, you know, you'll see some people that you're like, that guy's coming through in 315. Whoa. Right. And and you'll see, you know, the gazelles basically passed out uh, after six six hours on still on course. It's like, you know, you cannot judge a runner nope. based on, uh, you know, based on how they look. And so I think running in that sense is very, you know, has a very even uh, inclusive feel. Also, I, when I travel around a lot, I'd go to running groups. I'd drop in on running stores at whatever city I happen to be at. And nobody ever was like, oh, who are you? What are you doing here? They'd be like, oh, hey, I haven't seen you around. It's like, oh, you're new? Oh, what, what are you training for? And you know, you get right into the typical runner conversation, <laughs> even if we just met. And so I think runners are uh, very open that way. That said, I do understand, you know, uh, for, like you said at the beginning, it's like the, all the Bible literature is all written by men. There's very little, um, there's very little accommodation for how to deal with women, how to deal with uh, menstrual cycle, you know, how the menstrual cycle affects your performance, how puberty, menopause, all these things, even, you know, even like maintaining good bone health and things like that. It's like people don't talk about those, you know, coaches don't talk about those kinds of things. Um, and they talk up, and also I think, you know, the way that makes running feel like a little exclusive to a lot of people that I work with is 
uh, this constant focus on distance and pace. How fast are you? You know, let's define your runner by how fast they are or how far they go. They're a marathoner, they're a 305 marathoner, they're a 315 marathoner, they're, you know, whatever, right? So it's like, everybody talks about this this way. And I think that's very, that's very, uh, it's, it's just not very nice because it's like, you know, people are people. It's like, you know, everybody can have a bad day, right? So it's like, yep. I, you know, your Chicago marathon, for example, is like, you know, you don't want, you don't want to hang your identity on that. Right. It's like, of course you're better than that, but you know, and maybe someday you decide I'm not a marathoner. Right. So it's like, it's not in your, it's not in your DNA. It's just something you do. And so I think categorizing people into like, you know, pace and distance, I think is, is very off putting for a lot of people. And especially, I, you know, when I talk to new people and they're like, do I have to put myself into a 5k bucket to call myself a runner? Right. And do I have to, yep. do, I, do I, you know, do I have to race to be a runner? It's like, no, you don't have to. Right. It's like, and then trail runners, it's like, you know, I mean, trail versus road It's like they're everybody, you know, I think having these like dichotomies where you label people, I think with these distant, you know, with these things that are not related to like their personality, I think is, is very off putting. And it's kind of, it's kind of that, sort of boxing people into, into things. So I don't, I don't get, I actually don't talk a lot about paces with my, my runners because it's like, I don't, I don't want that to be like a thing. So it's a fine feature, right? No. And it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not about who you, that's not who you are. I mean, who you are is your, your goal and how you're striving to get there and all the things you do to try to get there. It's not, it's not like how fast you run. And, you know, again, so I feel like Inclusion comes in a lot of different ways, but a, a big part of, I think, what creates a barrier is the number kind of focus. Listen, I, trust me, I get it. I get it. I, uh, that's like one of those things that I'd say I've, I've probably been a little bit more vocal on lately of how we need to let go let go, and I'm putting it nicely, let go of our connection to pace, particularly pace. And in general, though, I'm very much, I'm like, can we just not talk about numbers? Like, let's not talk about numbers. You know, I, I, I've i said this as well on a, on a few of these conversations where it's like even something like heart rate training, right? Where a few years ago, nobody was talking about that. And now everyone's talking about it and people are like stressing out over it. And it's like, but wait, it's, you know, this is something on your watch. Like it's, it's, you're getting this information from your watch and the information may not even be accurate. And you're, you're thinking, oh, I had a good run because my heart was where I it needed to be. Or I had a bad run because my heart rate was too high. And it's like, no, like, did it feel good? Did it feel right. good? Did it feel good? Did, did that run feel like easy? Did it feel, did that run feel hard? And, you know, I oftentimes, it, like I tell people this where I've had people ask me like, how do I know if I'm running easy? And I'm like, one of the questions I ask is, do you have headphones on? Are you listening to music? Like what, right. can, you, can you give me a little more information? And I'm like, okay, if they tell me I have headphones on and I'm listening to music, I tell them, hey, you know how you know you're running easy when you can sing the song and like, you're not like, <laughs> if you can run at a, easy enough pace and sing the song the entire time then we're yep. good like that's one of those things where we're and I would do that I used to be a part of a run club or I would host a run club and people would run with me and they're like I don't know how you can talk the entire time and I don't know I can't do this and I'm like well I'm actually talking for you like I'm talking for you because then you have to respond to me and I can hear how you're breathing and how you're responding and I'll know if I need to slow down or if we can speed it up. Like it's, I'm talking because I just like to talk, but your response is giving me information that you don't realize that you're giving me. So I just love, I love that response so much of, of that particular bit of letting go or not focusing so much on distance and pace because we do, like, I remember when I first started running, I had done a few half marathons and I kept getting asked, so what are you doing the marathon? What are you right. doing the marathon? And I'm like, why can't I just be okay with where I'm at? Like, why can't I just like, why do we have to think that because you start running, you're automatically going to want to go 5k, 10k, half marathon, marathon, maybe an ultra. Like, why can't we just be where we're at and have that be okay? 
And I think part of it is that, you know, us runners, we get really excited about running and races and we, we do get excited about those. But I think sometimes with people, particularly people who are very new to the sport, they're going to see that as like, oh, wait, I'm not a runner if I'm not doing that. Or I don't think I want to do that. So can I be here? Or, right. and I'm sure you've heard it too, with like different run clubs and whatnot where, and I've heard it often too, for myself where it's like, oh, I, I'm too slow. I can't go. And it's like, it's okay. Like right. I'll walk with you. We can do run walk. I'm okay. Like, right. listen, the easier I can take it, the better it is. No problem. So I just wholeheartedly agree with, with you I on think, that. I think it's sort of funny because it's like it, to me, it's a subtle way of ranking people, right? It's like, I mean, we do talk about it a lot because it's like, you know, what are you training for? I'm training for a half marathon. You know, do you have a goal? Yes, I have a time goal, right? So it's like, it comes up, but but I, I don't like putting people in boxes that way. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I love track workouts for groups is because it's a it's 400 meters, we go round and round. Everybody's like, so the fast guys are always no more than 200 meters from the slow people. Right. It's like, we're all way, we're all in the slow <laughs> and yeah. maybe going around, around a little faster, but every, and, and at the end of the day, everybody has, everybody experiences the workout the same way. So they're like, oh man, I was okay until the third rep. And then man, I got started to suck. It's like, it doesn't matter how fast you were going. It's like, we all experience that mm-hmm. workout in that exact same way. And so, you know, it's like, it, it's about, yeah, everybody putting in the effort to do what they can do. And it's not about how fast you're going round and round. And I used to tell, I used to tell the, the, um, the group leaders, I'm like, if you want a social workout, do a track workout because people can't run away. <laughs> it's like, it's it's like on, a, on a, on a group run, the fast guys run away, they run into the night and you never yes. see them until they come oh, back. Oh yeah. That's right? happened to me before. But on the right. track, it's like, nope, they're still there, right? It's like, There's no getting away from it. Everyone's still together. They're Absolutely still there. right. And the slow people are still there and they, everybody can talk. Like, on the, you know, like, do you know what rep we're on? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, this is a hard one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you get this little side conversation. You get more interaction. And then at the end, it's like, you know, when you hear the, the quote unquote fast guy going, man, I was doing okay until I hit that fourth rep. And then Jesus, I was like, suck the life out of me. And you're like, yeah, hit me the same way. Oh it humanizes God. it. <laughs> it really does. It humanizes, it humanizes the workout. And it just, it's, it's a great reminder. And I love how you said, it's like, we all experience the workout in the same way. Like whether you're doing it, whether you're doing that 400 in two minutes, whether you're doing that 403 minutes, like you're all experiencing it the same way. You're just on different timelines. So I really appreciate, I really appreciate you mentioning that and highlighting that for us all. Final, it's not, it's a, it's a final request. How can people (laughs) connect with you better? Where can they find you online? What's the best way to reach out to you? And do you have anything exciting coming up that we can support and cheer you on in? Um, well, thanks for asking. Um, I am, I have a website, it's coachnaomi.com. So yay, I got that. I got the URL for that. So, <laughs> so um, you can reach me through that. There's a contact me. There's also a place where I, I kind of talk about a little bit about my coaching philosophy and stuff. So if you're like, yeah, let's see if, you know, but there's, there's a contact me form and you can basically just throw, throw something in there and we'll, we can, we can start chatting. Um, and then I have an Instagram, it's run Akamai and Akamai is Hawaiian for smarty pants, like kind of smart. It's, it's kind of a slangy thing. And so, you know, my, my handle is my Instagram handle is basically run Akamai, which is sort of like run smart or run smarter. Run. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh. So, yeah. So I'm not super active on Insta cause it's, it's just hard, but, but, um, and I'm on, on Strava as Naomi Morita. So, um, you know, and that's usually where I put most of my running accomplishments or whatever. I just finished Honolulu. So I'm sort of like in the, in the recovery zone. You're in a nice <laughs> little recovery bubble right now. Enjoy yes. it. Enjoy so that. I'm trying to, trying to figure out if the next one's going to be go faster or go for a faster half marathon. So I was like, but I'm in, I'm in that little zone. So yeah. And yeah. I'm, trying to build up some clientele. So this is the third time I rebuild a business because the first time was the first time. The second time was after pandemic and the third time was after moving to Hawaii. So 
reach out to me. We can do the Bluetooth, you know, coaching. I thing. love that. The Bluetooth <laughs> coaching. I'm so happy. <laughs> I just love that so much. I love that so much. Naomi, thank you so much for chatting with me and for sharing all your thoughts, all your knowledge. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Do you fun. have any final words for anybody that's listening? Um, so try to remember running is for fun. So that's all there is. It's got to be fun. That's all there is. And we're going to end it on that. We'll <laughs> see you all real soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>